have you heard about long COVID? I'm sure many of you know at least one person who had long COVID. It might even be you. Just an example. A young woman, 28 years old, let's call her Sarah for this talk, she goes to her doctor complaining of persistent symptoms of pain, fatigue, tachycardia. She's also experiencing issues with her memory and concentration, the so-called brain fog. Her symptoms are so debilitating that she's bedbound, unable to resume work. However, at standard examination, nothing is found. Lab tests come back normal. There is no obvious organic cause to all her symptoms. The only thing the doctors find out is that Sarah, six weeks before, had a mild form of COVID. So the diagnosis is long COVID. According to the WHO, while most people with COVID-19 will recover and return to their normal health, some individuals will experience persistent symptoms that will last weeks or even months after the resolution of the acute illness. So you are recovered, but not healthy. I find the topic of long COVID fascinating. As a neuroimmunologist, my passion is to understand the interaction between the brain and the immune system. And we are just starting to figure out how this crosstalk can affect our health and impact disease. So what I find interesting in long COVID is that the symptoms include fatigue, pain, brain fog. And you know what these symptoms have in common? They are all brain symptoms. They are the indication of a brain function not working properly. So now we have a viral infection of the lung that weeks or months later affects the brain. How is this possible? Actually, this is known also for other viruses. It's called post-viral syndrome. So what happens is that the strong immune reaction that our bodies mount to get rid of the virus lingers and stays even after the virus has been eliminated. And this uncontrolled immune reaction can affect the brain. So what post-viral syndromes like COVID and long COVID show you is that the immune system can have an effect on the brain. And look, this is something that all of you have experienced at least once in your life, I'm sure. You know when you have a cold with a bit of fever and you're feeling sad and depressed and miserable and all you want to do is just to be in bed the whole day. So that's called sickness behavior. It's an adaptive protective mechanism whereby our immune system, while busy fighting the virus, tells the brain, calm down, we need energy somewhere else. Your immune system can make you depressed. And that happens just with a simple cold. Imagine what can happen when the immune system goes in override in severe autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis or other immune-related diseases like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. Brain symptoms like pain, fatigue and brain fog are actually typical and occur very often in almost any autoimmune disorder. And here's another thing that I find interesting in long COVID. These brain symptoms, like pain, fatigue, brain fog, they tend to occur more often in women than men. And in general, autoimmune disorders affect more women than men. 65% of patients affected by multiple sclerosis are women. 75% of patients with fibromyalgia are women. Why women? To answer this question, in 2016, I co-founded a non-profit organization called the Women's Brain Project to study sex and gender determinants to brain and mental health. And it turns out that the immune system of women, and especially young women, is stronger than in men. And so this strong immune system, on one hand, protects them from viral infection, but on the other hand, puts them at high risk for autoimmune disorders. So, biologically, women are more vulnerable to these disorders, and yet the diagnosis often comes late or is missed. A young woman suddenly changes personality. She has psychosis and very severe headaches. No brain damage is found. 
her doctors notice that she has no children. So they think maybe this is a way to attract her husband's attention. She has NMDA receptor encephalitis, a devastating autoimmune disorder attacking the brain. A woman in her 30s wakes up one day blind. People around her kept asking, what is it that you don't want to see? So the idea here is that maybe she had a problem at work and she was just shutting the whole world out. She has multiple sclerosis. A lady, mid-age, complains to her doctor of issues with her memory and concentration and cognitive function. The doctor diagnoses depression. It's early Alzheimer's. And the diagnosis of Alzheimer's will be given only years later. So what happens is that when no obvious organic cause is found, symptoms are ascribed to psychosomatic issues. Basically, the message we are giving to patients is, get over with it. It's all in your head. And this is a particularly big problem for women because of historical entrenched gender stereotypes, whereby women are, by definition, overreacting and hysterical. So because of a combination of a complex and a challenging diagnosis and gender stereotypes, entire groups of patients had to fight for decades to have their symptoms recognized as a real neurological disorder. Patients affected by disorders like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. And most of these patients are women. Dismissing symptoms in one patient leads to misdiagnosis or late diagnosis of a potentially severe disorder. Dismissing symptoms in an entire group of patients means we are neglecting whole diseases. We are not studying them, we are not learning from them and about them. Not listening to patients is a missed opportunity for medicine and science. And here, is where I believe that long COVID represents a turning point in medicine. You remember Sarah? Sarah's symptoms included pain, fatigue, brain fog, exactly like fibromyalgia. And there was no obvious organic cause found. However, nobody told her, get over with it. Nobody told her it's all in your head. With long COVID patients, we are not dismissing their symptoms. We are listening to their stories, collecting their symptoms, and studying the symptoms behind them. We have cohorts of long COVID patients. We have research projects, and we have dedicated funding. And the results of these studies will be instrumental to figure out this interaction between the brain and the immune system. And this will have an impact not only on long COVID patients, but also on patients affected by other disorders like multiple sclerosis or chronic fatigue syndrome. So this overall change in the attitude towards patients and their disorders that we are witnessing, this is, I believe, a turning point in medicine. And this is a historical occasion that we have, we must seize. So the question is, why? What is different now with long COVID? What is different in 2021 is access to digital technology. Communication. For the first time in history, patients, hundreds, thousands of them, have the possibility to connect, share their symptoms, and create communities. And that's when you realize that you're not alone, you're not crazy, that there are other people out there experiencing the same. So patients, organizations, and communities gain traction demanded answers and started lobbying. Patient networks and patients' organizations have been made possible by social media. Then we have access to novel medical digital technology that can give voice to the symptoms of the patients. We have apps and sensors that can track in real time and in a longitudinal way objective data documenting the symptoms. And this gives the doctors the possibility to have an overview of the evolution of symptoms in a patient over weeks or months. And this is important because it expands and validates the recollection of symptoms that a patient might have on the day of the medical visit. And we have artificial intelligence. We have a tool that allows us to collect a humongous amount of data and make sense out of it. So I believe 
this is a time to be ambitious. We are witnessing a historical change, and we have to seize this opportunity. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take advantage of the lesson of long COVID and out of a tragedy find novel solutions for medicine? Wouldn't it be a revolution if patients could become agents of change and work with their doctors to find solutions for their own medical problems? And this is happening. I see this happening. My friend Maya, for instance, Maya and I studied pharmacy together. When Maya started to have weird symptoms like tinnitus, fatigue, pain, uh, she ascribed them to, to stress, like many women. However, then her eyelids started to droop and the vision from that eye started to be foggy. And Maya was brave enough to contact a neurologist. Together, Maya and her neurologist have embarked in a long journey to figure out what is happening. At every visit, Maya brings her own research. Yes, Google. And she brings a picture of her eyelid taken on her phone. And together with the neurologist, they discuss lab results, options, hypotheses, and future steps. Maya has recently found out there is a novel lab test that might apply to her case. And the neurologist did not know about this and was delighted to have this information. So they have booked together an appointment and we will see the rest of the story. What you have in Maya's story is three fundamental principles. First, equality. Listen to each patient. Go beyond sex, age, ethnicity, stereotypes give the right solution to the right patient. Second, active participation. Engage the patient in the medical process. Set aside dogmas and certainties and be curious together. And third, responsibility. The patient becomes subject and not just object of medical decisions. All this empowered by technology. Equality, active participation, and responsibility are fundamental principles of a democratic society. So maybe after COVID and with digital technology, we can build a more democratic approach to medicine. Thank you.